Good morning. Wow, what a great crowd. Good morning. I want to thank you all for being here. My name is Alex Brody. I am the Director of Meetings at the Association of the United States Army. And again, thank you for being here. I can't think of a better way to kick off the 2020 AUSA Breakfast Series than to do so in this very special location with the Chief of Staff, General James McConville. Appreciate everyone being here. and. I want to wish you a happy new year. To get started, I'm going to introduce Ms. Tammy Call. She's the director here at the museum. She'd like to say a few things about this wonderful museum that we're all in today. Please help me welcome Mrs. Tammy Call. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. General McConville, General Ham, all of our guests. Welcome to the National Museum of the United States Army. We look forward with a great excitement of opening the doors to the public on June 4th, 2020. Four and a half months away, but nobody's counting. <laughs> You're getting just a glimpse today of what a phenomenal museum this is going to be. And we really encourage all of you to help us spread the word as we prepare to become the front door to America's Army. So with that, welcome to the museum where we will uh, honor and welcome hundreds of thousands of visitors every single year. So welcome, enjoy your day. Well, thanks, Tammy. Thank you very, very much uh, for this wonderful facility. How many of you are here visiting the museum for the first time, for the very first time? Look at that, General Hartzog. You know, most everybody. How many are you, of you are here for the last time? <laughs> Nobody, not a single hand. All right, this is, uh, this is truly impressive. And even in just this, this large uh, uh, opening area, open area, uh, you get but a glimpse of the tremendous history uh, of our Army. And so we are very, very proud to, uh, to, to partner with the Army Historical Foundation, uh, the National Museum of the United States Army, and welcome you uh, to this breakfast. We can't do AUSA events without sponsors, to include even ones like this uh, at this great museum. And this morning's sponsor, uh, General Dynamics, uh, represented this morning by Mr. Chris Marzilli. Chris, for you and the whole General Dynamics team, who's been such a great partner for the Army and for our association for so many years, thank you very, very much for this morning. I could spend about the next 40 minutes introducing the, the people, the, the, the luminaries who have gathered here this morning, but the chief has told me not to do that. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that, but with a couple of exceptions. I am gonna uh, single out a, a couple of a very special guests, a very special guests uh, joining us this, this morning. The 32nd Chief of Staff of the United States Army, General Dennis Reimer. The 33rd Chief of Staff of the United States Army, General Rick Shinsek. We're pleased this morning to 
have the civilian leadership of the United States Army represented by Dr. Casey Wardinsky and Mr. Alex Beeler, Assistant Secretaries of the Army. Two uh, former Sergeants Major of the Army, Ken Preston and Dan Daly. <laughs> and our civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army from Washington, D.C., Mr. Woody Goldberg. Woody. <laughs> that doesn't mean the rest of you aren't special. You're just not quite that special, right? <laughs> But we're very, very thankful that all of you are here, uh, our, our allies and partners who have joined us this morning. Uh, some of the troops are here, the soldier representative across the, the total United States Army. We really are very, very pleased that you're all uh, joined us this morning. Uh, members of the congressional staff who are here as well, uh, an important uh, friend and partner who keep the Army on the straight and narrow. So thanks very much for that. Um, before I introduce the Chief, a couple of uh, upcoming events to take note of. Uh, our February breakfast series will be on the 18th of February with Lieutenant General Thomas Horlander, who's going to tell us on his budget rollout. I think none of you, all of you know the President's budget will be delivered on the 10th of February. So the 18th of February at AUSA, Thomas Horlander is going to tell us exactly where all that Army money is going to go. Okay. No pressure, General Horlander, no pressure whatsoever. Um, we hope that, that many of you will join us in, in Huntsville. I know Dr. Radinsky will be there at his, at his home, uh, 17 through 19 March uh, for the 2020 Global Force Symposium uh, in Huntsville, Alabama. We look forward to that. Uh, if you need a break from this cold weather, uh, plan on going out to Hawaii in, in May for Land Pack, 19 through 21 May. And in June, for the first time, we will host an event in partnership with Army Futures Command in Austin, Texas, 23 to 25 June in Austin. And General McQuistian would counsel me if I didn't remind everyone, 266 days until the annual meeting. <laughs> we are honored this morning, as we are in most Januaries, to welcome our Chief of Staff, the Chief of Staff of the United States Army. Um, many of you have had the opportunity to meet and serve with General McConville in his many and varied assignments uh, throughout his time in the Army. Uh, we got to uh, see him uh, uh, more publicly last October at the annual meeting where he, he, he rolled out his, his vision for the Army, his views for the Army, his priorities. Um, and I would tell you, Chief, uh, the word that I heard more often than any other from people who had not known you before, who had not heard you before, said, that man is genuine. Um, and I think one of the things we would recognize in this room that soldiers have lots of attributes and characteristics. One of them is soldiers have pretty refined bullshit detectors, <laughs> right? And, uh, and I think when the, when the chief spoke, uh, everybody recognized that he was speaking from the heart. He is a soldier's soldier, uh, exactly the right leader that the Army needs at this time. Please welcome the 40th Chief of Staff of the United States Army, General Jim McConnell. Appreciate that. Well, well good morning, and, and thank you, General Ham, for that kind introduction. It's great to have um, the 33rd Chief of Staff of the Army, General Ryman Sir, here. Uh, the 34th Chief of Staff of the Army, General Shinseki. That's all right. I, Chiefs do that. We got these numbers. I'm the 40th. You kind of you kind of work that around. Uh, I checked. It was on the information highway, so we're, we're okay with the numbers. Uh, but but also General Allen, General Campbell, General Wagner, General Hardsog, um, our assistant secretaries, sergeant majors of the Army, uh, Daly and Preston. Uh, you know, you you have left us a proud legacy that we strive to live up to every single day. It's always a great day to be United States Army because we serve with the world's greatest soldiers. And if you saw their performance over the last couple of weeks, it was absolutely amazing. So how about a hand for our soldiers?
And today is a great day because we get a sneak preview of our, of our new Army National Museum. And as was said, the grand opening is in June, and I've had a chance to walk around, and, and this is going to be a world-class facility. It's going to be a fitting tribute to the heroism and heritage of our soldiers in our Army. So I, I really encourage everyone to come back. I'm certainly going to come back. You know, people first, winning matters. It's more than just a slogan. People first is a philosophy. I believe that the United States Army is the best army in the world because we have the best people in the world. Our soldiers, our civilians, our families, and our soldiers for life, our retirees and volunteers are the greatest strength of our army. And I believe that if we take care of our people, we get them at the right jobs at the right time and right place, they will deliver on our Army priorities of readiness, modernization, and reform. And winning, matter to, win, winning matters is an attitude. It's an attitude that we send the United States Army somewhere, we're not going to participate. We're not going to try hard, we're going to win. And there's no second place or honorable mention in combat. And that attitude was evident in the 82nd Airborne Division, when we alerted them and they deployed on no notice, and I mean no notice, absolutely no notice, on New Year's Eve day to Iraq. And they did it in incredible fashion. And it's that attitude that's in all our troops that is serving in harm's way around the globe. Now, we are very, very blessed to have a great secretary, Secretary McCarthy. And he and I aren't trying to fight the last fight better. We're focused on winning the next fight. In order to do that, we recognize the need for transformational change. And we can't get transformational change with incremental improvements. So I brought my lunch here. No, it's not my lunch. It's, um, some of you may recognize this. Um, you know, for those who are over the age of 30, this is what a phone used to look like, okay? And when I was a kid, this phone was on the wall, you know? And many of the older people in the front rows, this phone was on the wall, right? And, you know, if you made a phone call, you went up to the wall, you dialed this little thing, and that's what you did, okay? But then people said, you know, we, we want to be able to walk around the house with the phone, right? So what we did is we put a cord on the back of it, and it was a long cord, and we were able to walk around the house with the cord. And that was what I would call incremental improvement, not transformational, informational. Then people found we were knocking lamps over, it was getting caught on furniture, so the phone company said, hey, here's what we're going to do. Let's get rid of the cord, right? So then people said, well, we can walk around with the house, so we had a cordless phone. This would be great if we could go outside and drive around and talk on our phone, right? And, and what was that ruined meals and dinners and anniversary and birthdays forever because we'd all be on our phone while we were out eating dinner. But anyways, so what happened along the way was, you know, someone said that, you know, what if we could take a picture with a phone? And I like to imagine this in an army context. I can see a lieutenant coming to a general like me and he or she saying, sir, I got a great idea. We should be taking pictures with phones. And, I, and I'm sitting there, a guy like me saying, well, okay, how do you take a picture with this phone? Really? A selfie? <laughs> or, wait a minute, I think we could use this phone to navigate. Oh, well, how do you do that? We got these great things, they're paper, they're called maps, right? That's how we navigate. Or we can watch TV on the phone. And, you know, I can see us going, you know, hey, Lieutenant, uh, that'll be all. <laughs> and when she, he or she walks away, we're sitting there, these generals, these wise generals, we say something along the line, why, why that's, that's why he or she is just a lieutenant. And, but there were innovators, and there were some transformational change agents who gave us this, the mobile device. They transformed our understanding of what a phone could be. 
You know, it still makes phone calls, although most people who have kids, they won't call you, they'll text you. But it navigates, it takes photos, it does hundreds of other functions we never would imagine 40 years ago. And the point I'm making is that as we go forward, the Army needs help from our soldiers, our non-commissioned officers, our officers. We need help from our civilians. We need help from our industry partners, our allies and partners in achieving transformational change. Not so much of this, but more of this. And, you know, we need transformational change, not incremental improvements. That's what an incremental improvement looks like. And because transformational change is how we get overmatch and how we get dominance in the future. It's how we compete. It's how we deter great power comp competitors and if required, it's how we win on the future battlefield. And as we pursue the kind of transformational change I'm describing, it's important that we can't be constrained by our experiences. Experience is important, it's great. Uh, but it's sometimes new and different perspectives are necessary for innovation. And now that in innovation may come from a colonel, may come from a general, it might also come from a lieutenant, our sergeant, or someone from industry or academia or, or, or a combination of many. So we have to encourage innovation, look for it in unexpected places, and we must embrace it when we find it. That's how we get to transformational change. I would suggest that the last major transformational changes in our Army took place as we came out of Vietnam in the late 70s and 80s. And many of the great leaders in front of us led that change. You know, we changed the way we fought with the development of doctrine, new doctrine called air land battle. Out of the ashes of a field rescue attempt, thinking about this, in Iran, we developed new organizations like Ranger Battalions, the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, some special mission units. And look at the incredible work they've done, done over the last couple of decades. We built our combat training centers out of the National Training Center and the Joint Readiness Training Center, where we honed the combat readiness of our forces. We modernized our war fighting systems with the development of the Big Five, the Abrams tank, the Bradley fighting vehicle, the Apache helicopter, the Black Hawk helicopter, and the Patriot, and there were quite a few other ones. And we transformed our people processes, and we take this for granted now, by instituting the all-volunteer force, which gave birth to our, our incredible non-commissioned officer corps, which every other country wants to have. Our strategic leaders then recognized that we were at strategic, at a flexion point. We're engaged in great power competition with the Soviet Union and witnessing technological advances were, which were reshaping the character of war. The leaders of that day, and some of them are here, recognized that incremental change wouldn't deliver the army we needed to compete with the Soviet Union. So they resourced and built a new army, an army that deterred Soviet aggression, an army that won Desert Storm in 100 hours, an army that has fought so well against terrorism for the last two decades. In fact, the transformational change of the post-Vietnam era built the army today that has 187,000 soldiers committed in support of 140 countries around the world and accounts for more than 60% of our combatant commander's requirements. Think about it. We began building the Army of 2020 more than 40 years ago. And since then, we've incrementally improved our weapon systems that we failed in the 1970s and 1980s. And I would tell people we're starting to run out of letters that's why we have to get some new systems. When you get to the Z model, you got to get something new, right? Anyways, but take the M2 Bradley, one of our key fighting vehicles. Over the last 40 years, we've upgraded the Bradley to the M2A1 and then incrementally improved it to one version after another. We added improved armor. We increased the power capabilities. We upgraded our night vision sights, and we made many other improvements. And although the Bradley is a very formidable infantry fighting vehicle, I can't say that 40 years from now, it'll be the centerpiece of our mechanized infantry formations. We are reaching the limits of technology 
and designs we developed back in the 1970s. We can only add so much weight to some of our combat vehicles. We can only make our current helicopters fly so fast and so far. And not only that, conditions have changed. We recognize that we will be contested in all five domains, on land, in the air, on the sea, and in space, and cyber in the future. We realize that we will have to penetrate robust anti-access and aerial denial, which we call A2AD, defensive networks. We know that we will face emergent technologies like artificial intelligence, hypersonics, robotics, and the modern battlefield will look very different from the one 40 years ago, which is why I would submit that we are at a similar inflection point to the one our leaders face coming out of Vietnam. And like them, we have to ask ourselves, are we building the army that can compete and win for the next 40 years? I believe that only transformational change will build the army our future demands. And that's exactly what we're doing with the development of the multi-domain operations concept. We're changing the way we're going to fight in the future and where we'll be contested in every domain. That's why we're building new organizations, like the Security Force Assistance Brigades, like the Multi-Domain Task Forces, and the Information Warfare Command, which will enable us to compete below the level of armed conflict. That's why we're developing cyber ranges, so we can train cyber in, in, in a um, similar environment to our DIRT CTCs. That's why we're developing synthetic training environments. That's why we're laser focused on developing and fielding the six modernization priorities with 31 signature systems. And that's why we must implement our 21st century talent management system. And one of those initi initiatives, the Battalion Command Assessment Program, is going on as we speak. And a lot of our majors are really excited about that. And much of this is happening right now, not in 10 or 20 years. An example of transformational change is the integrated visual augmentation system. Uh, you can see it up there. It's not just an in incremental improvement to our night vision goggles. It's like, putting a, it, it's like putting on a slightly larger pair of Oakley sunglasses. It has both night vision and thermal capability in that heads-up display. But it's much more than an improved night vision device. In this device, our soldiers can see a three-dimensional map with friendly data. They can receive video from drones or other sources as they're on the battlefield. They can link their weapons site for faster aiming, and they can shoot around corners or from behind cover. But what I would argue is one of the most transformational um, concepts about this system is that you can use it with one world terrain to train in virtual reality. Think about it. You're on your way to a real world mission. And you can train with your team or squad, or at whatever echelon you desire, on the actual simulated terrain that you're going to conduct the mission in virtual reality, with less time and fewer resources. But not only that, and this is why I would encourage, encourage industry, the other thing that's transformational about the IVES is how we're developing it. Now, we took an innovative idea from some change agents like uh, General uh, C.D. Donahue and General Maria Gervais. And we went from initial development to a real-world system that's being used by our soldiers right now. And the soldiers are helping develop this in less than two years. And IVAS has the potential to fundamentally transform the way we train and we fight. It's all from a heads-up display that our soldiers are going to have. And as this gets out, there's going to be a whole bunch of things that we can do with this. I can envision a whole bunch of things, from how we operate under armor, how we interact with remote or autonomous vehicles. It's going to fundamentally transform the way we are doing business. But we're also getting transformation results in our six modernization priorities. In the long-range precision forest portfolio, our number one priority, we are having some early successes at the speed of relevance. We conducted successful tests of a precision strike missile last month. 
And I'm confident we're going to be able to engage targets at ranges of more than 500 kilometers very soon. And we project to have this system fielded in the next two to three years. Also in our fires portfolio, we have the extended range cannon, which has demonstrated the ability to engage targets precisely at, at 70 kilometers with potential for significant increases in the future. We project to start filling these systems in about two to three years as well. And I know there's a lot of interest in hypersonics, particularly given some recent claims by our other near-peer competitors. We are aggressively developing uh, these capabilities, and we expect to start testing and fielding hypersonic weapon systems over the next three years. We're developing mobile SURAD air defense systems because we know we're going to be contested uh, from the air for our maneuver units, and we begin fielding them next year. We've had successful tests of our integrated battle command system, IBCS, which can be transformational in that it's going to allow us to link sensors, multiple sensors, to multiple shooters on the battlefield and provide a more holistic defense against enemy air missiles and unmanned aerial systems. You know, we're developing next generation quad squad weapons, the rifle and the machine gun, and they are set to be fielded starting next year, and they will significantly significantly increase the range and lethality of our soldiers on the battlefield. And for future vertical lift, we are flying before we are buying. And we are very pleased with the in innovation we are seeing from industry in this area. We plan on developing and fielding a future long-range assault aircraft and a future attack reconnaissance aircraft in the next eight to 10 years. Note, these are aircraft and not helicopters, because the transformational requirements we've asked from industry are not resonant in traditional helicopters. I also want to mention the next generation combat vehicle. As many of you know, just last week we made the decision to cancel the solicitation we had out for the vehicles. We are fully committed to replacing the Bradley fighting vehicle in the future. However, like the future vertical aircraft, we want to drive these before we buy them. And for industry, that's the strategy we're going to take. We're going to experiment, we're going to prototype, we're going to want to see what we have before we invest a large amount of money uh, in, 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 these, in these programs. But we found out early in the process, after minimal investments, that our aggressive timeline did not permit industry to meet the requirements. We have taken a tactical pause in the solicitation. We're going to reset the requirements. We're going to reset the acquisition strategy and timeline. And then we're going to come out and aggressively pursue this critical weapon system that we need for the future. Now, I know we have a, quite a few of our allies and partners represented here this morning. Thank you all for being here. Being united with our allies and partners allows us to deter our competitors and negotiate from a position of strength. Our allies and partners are critical to what we do, and I don't see that changing. I've met with 75 of my counterparts, Army chiefs of charge from around the world in the last five to six months. And I can tell you this was very helpful when I talked to them during the last couple of weeks about some of the actions that we were taking. And all of them want to work closely with the United States Army. It's important we work closely with our allies and partners, not only to help us innovate and realize transformational change, but ensure that we maintain stability and security and interoperability uh, throughout the world. We need to aggressively pursue some of the high payoff initiatives that build strong relationships with our allies and partners. These initiatives include the International Military Education and Training P Program, which we call IMET. I can't count the number of chiefs or army, along with many of their senior leaders, that have exposure to our military and country through this program. Another is foreign military sales. I've found that the foreign military sales program is a great opportunity for our partners to prove their own capacities and capabilities while, in, while increasing interoperability with us. It's also a great opportunity to reduce costs and maintain our organic industrial base. And finally, 
the employment of our Security Force Assistance Brigades, SFABs we call them, in an advise and assist role, along with combined exercises with allies and partners, is increasing their capacities and capabilities, along with building interoperability. You can't show up on game day and expect to be able to operate effectively if you've never worked together. We have Defender 20 coming up in Europe this year, and it'll be the largest exercise in 25 years, over 20,000 troops coming from the United States. And a version out in the Pacific, a smaller number this year, but a bigger number next year as well. And these exercises will continue to be a preferred tool we use to strengthen relationships and build capability, both ours and our allies and partners. So to all our allies and partners here today, you are incredibly important to us. Our vision of the future includes close, productive ties with all of you, and we want to continue moving forward together. Let me close by saying it's an exciting time to be in the Army. We have a unique opportunity to set the Army on a course that will preserve overmatch and dominance in the next 40 years and ensure we can compete with and deter great power competitions and if, if required, to fight and win. We aren't looking for longer cords for our phones or faster horses for our cavalry. We aren't trying to fight the last fight better. We want to win the next fight. And it's going to take transformational change to get there. And it won't happen with incremental improvements. I look forward to all of your support in this endeavor. People first, winning mad as we remain Army strong. Thank you. And I think we're going to take a few questions. So I guess we have a few questions out there. Uh, Allies uh, and partners, we remain strong. That's right. Good morning, sir. My name is Major Dave Hankin from the Australian Defence Force. Uh, you spoke about the wide range of technical, technological advancements, uh, ensuring the Army remains relevant in a multi-domain operation. The initiative to select the right person for the right job through the Battalion Command Assessment Program is a vital step to achieve this. Do you believe that at the mid to senior rank levels, there is a deficit in understanding advancements in AI, robotics, space capabilities, and how do we achieve better education for the senior leadership to maintain relevance? Yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, one of the um, you know, points I was trying to make really during this speech was, you know, if you don't know about artificial intelligence, if you don't know about robotics, uh, don't you know, get the right people surround you that do. And, and don't be held hostage by your experiences because, you know, as I've learned in this job, I, I think one of the biggest things we can do that I want to learn about is data. You, know, you think about it, you know, I want to talk to you about data. And if you look at some of the things we're, we're trying to do, whether it's a joint all domain command and control system, if it's sensor to the shooter linkage, if you want to talk about machine learning or artificial intelligence, it all comes down to data. The ability to you know, standardize data, the ability to move data, the, the ability to secure data, and all the, the, the transformational um, advantages that we'll get involve data. So if you don't understand that, you're not going to get there. And what we can't do is slow down you know, maybe some of the younger people that have experience in that. So what I like to do is I'm throwing things out there. You know, help me figure out how to get data. Help me figure out that. Give some intent and not constrain young, innovative people who want to get after this. And that's what I'm trying to say to the general officers. You know, don't, you know, I got to use analogies because I don't know exactly what I don't know. But I don't want this, okay? I want this. And, you know, we need to get the right people in there to know about that stuff. So that's what we're trying to do. So thanks for the question. Hi, Over there. Jen Johnson with Defense News. Uh, you talked a little bit about the optionally manned fighting vehicle. Um, and I know it's, it's sort of been highlighted through this, this situation that the acquisition community and the Army Futures Command modernization community may have had some friction when it came to decision making with OMFV. So I'm wondering what the Army is doing to try to smooth um, things over with the acquisition community, Army Futures uh, Command modernization uh, command uh, in the future so that there isn't any butting heads um, and that they're able to work together, um, especially since time is of the essence. 
Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, what's making sure, and I get a, friction, I'm not sure I'm going to go with friction, although friction and heat makes steel makes you stronger, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. But, um, you know, I, I think it's very, very important uh, that our, you know, one of the reasons we went to, uh, one of the reasons we went to cross-functional teams is we want to bring operators, we want to bring technologists, and we want to bring acquisition professionals all together. And we want to move away from the linear industrial age process that we used in the past that would take us three to five years to get a requirement straight. And then we'd go through the acquisition process, take three to five years, maybe requesting for proposals and then getting uh, a program under contract. And then we'd take five to seven years later to, 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 to field that program. And after billions of dollars of expenditure, you may have something that is no longer relevant. So what we're trying to do is bring people together early in the process. And some people are not as comfortable with this as they should be, but they're getting that way because that's how we're going to do business. And what we're trying to show is the, the value of working together early in the process with everybody involved. And I think what you're going to see, um, and even during this tactical pause, is I've, I've, I've been with our acquisition professionals, I've been with Futures Command, and they understand the importance of working together. Uh, they're going to reset. They, like if there was a football game, they're going back in the huddle. They're going to call another play, and they're going to come out to the line of scrimmage, and they're going to they're get after it, and they're going to score a touchdown. So this is going to happen. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Hi, General Patrick Tucker from Defense One. Good to see you again. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the transformation that you're trying to get underway at Army Cyber, transforming it from a sort of conventional cyber warfare uh, operation into something that encompasses information warfare operations? It's sort of a big change. Thanks. Yeah, I think you know as as we as we look to the future. Um, you know, we're standing up different type organizations. Um, you know, we, like one of them uh, is the multi-domain task force. And a lot of people say, what is a multi-domain task force? Well, multi-domain task force, what it does, it, it has the ability to deliver uh, both uh, long-range precision effects and long-range precision fires. And as, as we look around the world, you know, people talk about information. You know, the truth matters. And what we see with, with some of our competitors is operating below the level of armed conflict, uh, they, they, they want to put just information out there. It happens every single day um, after, you know, in, in really throughout the world. So we want to have the ability to make sure that we can get the truth out there. So that's part of information operations. And it's tied into, you know, cyber. It's tied into electronic warfare. It's, it's tied into space. And all these elements come together and we want an organization that's going to synchronize those, and that's what the Information Warfare Command is going to do. So we've got one more question over here. Hi, Sarah. Ashley Roki with Janes. I want to follow up on OMFB. Um, the Army had plenty of warning from industry that there were problems with the timetable and the requirements. So as the service takes this tactical pause now, what are they actually going to do different to address some of these shortcomings that have cropped up time and time again? Well, what we learned from going through uh, the process uh, was what industry could produce. It was, it was a very aggressive timeline. We knew that going in, but when we met with industry, uh, the feedback we got was that they could do it. And the difference is, what we're doing now is, after a minimal investment uh, time frame, we're going to say, show us that you could actually do this. And so as, as we come back around with, with industry, uh, we're going to say, um, how much time will it take to get to the requirements that we need. So there's some more negotiation that's going to go on. And the way we're prototyping now is really to inform requirements. It's not necessarily, you know, we don't have requirements out there uh, like in space. You know, we, we meet with industry and we give them a problem set. And we say we want a vehicle that we think sh should have this many people, should be able to do this, th this many things, come back to us with a sketch of what that would look like. And then we take a look at what they come back with, and, and we kind of get an idea, well, hey, if you could do this, how about come back with a, a, a design, you know, a more rigorous design that shows us what that would look like? And then we can down select from that. How about come back with a model that shows us you could do this? Then how about come back with a prototype and so we can actually see and we can drive it before we can buy it? And that's the process we're going to take, and we'll continue that process. And then we're going to make the decision on time versus requirements that, hey, if you give us six more months or one more year, we can have this capability uh, in this vehicle. Because we want a transformational vehicle. We don't want to just incrementally improve the Bradley or we'll, we'll just keep incrementally improving the, 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 the Bradley. We want a transformational 
uh, vehicle that has open architecture that we can continue to improve over the next 40 years. Um, you know, I don't want to have a chief of staff that, I'm trying to figure out the numbers, so it's at least 10 for me, maybe chief of staff of the Army number 50 sitting here and saying, hey, how come McConnell left me with all this old stuff? You know, I want to have him, you know, in a, or her in a position where they, they're looking at equipment, you know, 40 years from now, it's only 40 years old, not 80 years old. And I think we need to do that. Of applause. All right, thank you all. Appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Well, thanks very much, Chief. Thanks for getting us off to a, a great start this uh, cold January morning as we begin uh, begin 2020. And indeed, the Army has been busy. Um, I would just uh, say before this crowd and to you, Chief, uh, this association uh, will do all that we can to support you and the soldiers, civilians of the total army uh, as you move forward on behalf of the nation. Thanks for sharing your time with us uh, this morning. For all of you, uh, one of the ways that we are able to support the army uh, is through your membership. If you're not an AUSA membership, I would ask you to consider be, uh, joining AUSA. You can do so this morning, uh, or you can do go on online, ausa.org. We value your membership. We need your membership in order to continue to support the Army in the way that, that the Army uh, richly deserves. Chris, uh, to you and General Dynamics, again, a uh, hearty thanks for your sponsorship for this wonderful event here this morning. Thank you very, very much uh, for, for doing that. Tammy, for you and the, and the team here at the National Museum of the United States Army, uh, thanks for, for hosting us at your home this morning. Uh, we look forward to, to continued progress and I think each of us looks forward with great anticipation to June 4th and the official opening of this magnificent facility. If you want to learn more about the National Museum of the United States Army, see Tammy, see General Hartsock, see any of the folks at the Army Historical Foundation or go to their website or go to the website of the National Museum of the United States Army and see all the goodness, the greatness that is being built and established here to recognize what is inarguably the most powerful land force on the planet, the United States Army. Thanks each and every one of you for joining us this morning. Let's have an Army strong day. Thank you.